Coaching Show. My name is Tom Corson Knowles, founder of Authentic Health Coaching. Hey, if you haven't checked us out over at AuthenticHealthCoach.com, please do. We have an amazing free report for you with Dr. Corson's top five nutrition tips. It's the number one guide to taking your health to the next level. And if you like the show today, go ahead and subscribe to us on iTunes, the Authentic Health Coaching Show, and you'll get updated on all our newest episodes. And today in the show, we have an amazing guest for you, Leslie Davenport. And Leslie is the author of Healing and Transformation Through Self-Guided Imagery. And she works in the hospital system helping patients recover and heal faster using the self-guided imagery. Uh, she's practicing at the Health and Healing Clinic at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco and Marin. She's also a clinical faculty member with the Institute for Health and Healing's Integrative Medicine Program. She's a faculty with John F. Kennedy University and a clinical supervisor for the California Institute of Integral Studies. And today in the show, she shares um, just an amazing experience in her wealth of knowledge on guided imagery and how you can use guided imagery to create a more healing in your body and just to create a healthier, happier, longer, more successful life just by allowing your mind to heal itself because you know, here's the truth of the matter. No doctor, no nutritionist, no fitness trainer will ever heal you of any disease. The only thing that can heal you is your body and your mind heals from within. And doctors and nutritionists and fitness experts and uh, you know, other experts, you know, they help, they help you with that healing process. But it all comes from within and uh, Leslie just shares some really, really powerful ways to connect with that inner healing source inside of you so you can take your health to the next level. And uh, I mean, this is powerful stuff. This is the stuff that Olympic athletes use so they can perform at higher levels. Um, it's the things that many, many uh, people who have recovered from serious diseases have used to help them heal because your mind is so powerful. So enjoy the show today and make it an amazing day. Well, Leslie, thank you so much for being with us today on the Authentic Health Coaching Show. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background and you know how you got interested in, in guided imagery in the first place? Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, boy, you know, it's one of those stories that has a pretty long history, so it depends how far I go back. But um, I think I'll start by saying that prior to doing what I'm doing now, I had a career for a number of years as a professional modern dancer. And it's really relevant to my work now because for me, dance was about exploring the link between our thoughts our emotions and our body. And of course, in a more artistic realm, what I was doing was if I allowed myself to feel a particular quality or emotion, and as a choreographer, let my body do what it naturally seemed to want to do. Did it want to collapse to the floor? Did it want to run with my arms open? Did it, you know, slump uh, asymmetrically to the side? I was sort of studying what uh, what the response was between our inner world and our physical experience. And, of course, I was not only looking at my own inclinations there, but what would happen when I worked with a group of dancers. And I did that for quite a long time. I have a, a master's degree in dance and did a lot of teaching and performing. And there came a point when... I wanted to kind of shift careers and went back to school, um, got a degree and a license in psychotherapy. But for me, it was still very much about the mind-body-emotional link, but I was just coming at it sort of through a different door. And back in 1989, when I was uh, finishing school and beginning to accrue hours of experience that are required for becoming licensed. I set up an internship for myself in a hospital environment, very much because of this body-mind-spirit link. And I wanted to go even further and explore oh, not only what happened expressively, but what does it actually do to our health and well-being? Um, and what can it do to, what can we do working with those same channels to support healing. And I have to say that my explorations in dance have always felt like the precursor to to what I'm doing now because that way of sort of tapping into myself, what I think of as a form of deep listening. And even when I used to teach dance, I would teach with a lot of images. I would say, you know, let your legs move like lightning, but your arms move like clouds. 
So I um, began to introduce relaxation training and forms of meditation and guided imagery um, in the hospital in 1989. And since then, it has just been a very rich and evolving path. I've, I, I've stayed within the hospital environment, have developed a number of guided imagery programs, and continue to do that work now in San Francisco um, through what's called the Institute for Health and Healing at California Pacific Medical Center. Well, that's awesome. And so, you know, Visualization, is that something that's only for people who are visual people? I mean, obviously some people are kinesthetic, some people are more like to learn auditorily. Is this only something for visual people or just something that everyone can enjoy? I love this question because the answer is no, no, no. In fact, it's kind of a, a myth or a misconception. And I really try and veer away from, some people use visualization and guided imagery interchangeably, but it does tend to, to say visualization sets up a bias that you have to be able to picture something crystal clear with your eyes closed. And you're absolutely right that in, in the same way that we have uh, a way of relating to the world with multiple senses, our eyes, our ears, our sense of smell, our sense of touch, the same is true in our internal domain. So we have, you know, inner vision, as you're pointing to. But for some people, when they quiet down and turn their attention inward, they may hear a phrase that just brings a state of clarity to something that they were pondering. They may have a sense of knowing that they feel more kinesthetically through their body. So when I work with imagery, I... Uh, in a sense, recruit, as I'm working with a person, the different channels that the information can flow in through, and it certainly doesn't have to be visual. I think the reason that myth is out there a little bit is that it is the slight majority. They say about 60% of people have their inner eyes, their inner vision as their primary mode, but if you're in that other 40%, it doesn't make it any less uh, helpful, any less powerful. Great. So, yeah, it's really something that everyone can use and everyone can enjoy. Mm -hmm. And so tell us about how guided imagery helps to heal the body. I mean, how does that work? Okay. Well, um, let me start with just a very kind of day-to-day -day example, and then I can uh, say that the research is really backing the various applications of this. But if we did something like just took a minute to remember a recent situation that made us feel very angry or upset in some way, maybe we had an argument with a friend. And when we start remembering it, especially if it feels unresolved and we're going to have to speak to this person again, once our mind goes there and we start remembering what that person looked like and what we said and what we wished we had said and how we felt in the moment, if we're with it for very long, even 30 seconds onward, and we pay attention, we can start to notice a lot of changes in our body. It begins to tense our muscles. We might feel flushed. Um, we might notice our heart speeds, speeds up. We might be you know, feeling anxious about what's going to happen next. And there ends up being a, a, a very comprehensive physical response when we're with the images of that memory and of that experience. And it's so strong, in fact, that some of the research that's been done with what they call functional MRIs, and they will put someone into a machine that can map the activity of the brain while they ask the person to think about something or remember something. And they're finding that the parts of the brain light up in almost identical ways when someone imagines or remembers an incident pretty much equally to if it was happening in real time, if they were actually conversing with that person or arguing with that person. And the, the variety of ways that our body responds affects virtually every organ in the body. Again, respiratory, cardiac, uh, there's a whole cascade of chemicals that affect our hormone and limb system. And it's, it's been referred to quite a bit as 
taking us into the sympathetic nervous system or what's called the fight or flight response. And so in the same way that simply remembering an incident like that can change our whole physical state, the same is true if we intentionally think about or picture a very relaxing environment where we might like to go on vacation or a place that uh, we've been that when we're there we just feel carefree and no stress. We can be exactly who we are. And our body follows suit and it begins to change chemically and it puts us into what's been now called the relaxation response. And the effect of these different states on the body are fairly profound because it's, it's believed that when we look at our human being species from an evolutionary perspective, that that tension, that fight and flight response was originally designed in a way that it might get activated occasionally. There's a threat in the environment, you know, there's a wild animal and we need to get away from it and so our body kicks into motion so that we can do that easily. But what's happened is that in our contemporary life, there are so many ongoing stresses just over and over, anything from traffic to finances to a lot of things that weren't uh, happening in the same way. But our body's adjustment hasn't caught up to that, and so there's been a real wear and tear on our bodies as a result of the world changing, but our bodies not adapting as quickly. So as those channels get mapped of whatever is happening in our mind is related to what's happening in our body, guided imagery has become sort of an art and science of how to release the stressful images and responses and kind of minimize that as best we can, given that it is a stressful world, but how to cultivate also health and healing imagery that can help that bring that into balance. Awesome. And so what you're saying is that guided imagery is not only a tool to release those negative emotions like anger and stress and frustration, but also to put in the good emotions like love and joy and happiness. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, we're talking about health because, um, you know, obviously that is a strong physical part, and I work in a hospital environment. But as you're pointing to, um, it also affects what we might think of as our mental-emotional health, you know, our outlook on life, just how content we might feel, um, how it might affect our uh, you know, social circle and friendships and relationships. And it truly has gone into pretty much every human discipline. It's very common, for example, to use imagery in optimal sports performance, that in imagining or sort of a mental rehearsal of shooting uh, an accurate basketball hoop has improved performance uh, beyond just the physical practice of it. And so that bringing in the focus of our mind and emotions and through the imagery channel has uh, very concrete benefits as well. Awesome. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about the research and, you know, what benefits have been found so far? Okay. You know, it's it's just growing and growing and growing. Um some of the best research, again, as it relates medically, has come out of the Cleveland Clinic. They did a couple of major studies um, oh, probably 10 years ago now related to surgery, and that these are major surgeries. They did one related to um, colon surgery, one related to heart surgery, so very significant. And they found that when people used imagery, to prepare for surgery, meaning that they are sort of like what I said with the basketball rehearsal. They're rehearsing the, the surgery going very well, that their body is cooperating with minimal bleeding, um, you know, the, the positive outcome because, as we know, we tend to rehearse negative scenarios a lot. That's kind of the definition of worry. 
we worry, what's going to go wrong, or what if this happens, what if that happens? Um, so this is like a po the positive outcome, that people had shorter hospital stays, they had fewer complications, they had a decreased need for pain medication. You know, it's it's fairly astonishing how, you know, what can sound like something as simple as, you know, really? Just kind of thinking about it that way makes that much of a difference. But these are studies that were published in major medical journals and have luckily helped open the door to bring these kinds of patient services into hospital environments. There's quite a few also in the um, area of cancer, uh, even to the point of being able to strengthen the immune function, you know, and because research is being done in the medical world, it's as specific as drawing blood and counting how many blood cells are there and then post-imagery drawing blood again and noticing a marked difference higher than what would happen had the imagery not taken place. Wow, that's really cool. And yeah. do you think that the placebo effect has something to do with your line of work? Do they coincide somehow? Well, you know, I'm sure that what we understand about the placebo effect bumps up perhaps the percentage point a little more about the effectiveness. But I also like to let people know that imagery works whether or not you believe in it. And I'll give you a way to think about this that I think will make the point in a simple way. So if we go to the movies, and let's say we're watching an action-adventure movie, our rational mind knows, okay, this is just fiction, you know, these are only actors, nobody's really getting hurt, the story probably didn't even happen. But what makes the movie so fun is that in spite of knowing that, when those images get on the screen, uh, our heart races with the characters, you know, with the excitement, we're sitting on the edge of our chair, we gasp, we sigh, you know, and we have this full range of a physical experience based on what's going on, even though rationally we know that is just a story. And that's because... Imagery uses a different part of our brain than our thinking, you know, our usual day-to-day -day thinking mind. In just the most simple terms, most people are familiar with left hemisphere, right hemisphere. So our day-to-day -day activity tends to be very left hemisphere oriented. It's tremendously helpful. What are we going to do next? And let's figure out this problem. And um, language comes out of that realm. And I hope I always have those abilities. But imagery takes us over to the right hemisphere. It's the, it's the realm of emotions, intuition. It's the language of imagery. And so when we are thinking those thoughts about the movie, that's coming from one part of our brain. But when we see those images, it's coming in through the other half. And that's what happens either whether our eyes are clo uh, open, looking at a movie screen, or closed, being attentive to the images that are going through our mind's eye or our inner world. And and so that's why it, you don't have to believe it. There's an actual infrastructure into how we're put together as people um, where images are part of the currency of how we experience life. It's just that in sort of our Western world at this point in time, there's not a lot of education and it tends to be um, underutilized. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think you're so right that, you know, your images and what you, what you think and what you visualize in your mind is absolutely connected to your physiology. And, you know, I tell people all the time that you're, everything's connected, that everything matters, that your thoughts matter, what you put in your body matters, and that if you've got a disease, it's like going on, maybe heart disease, you know it affects every area of your body and your mind as well. It's all connected. You can't separate the two. Yes. In fact, I like that you compared it to, 
to food, what we put in our body, because I, I, I often think about it that way. You know, what's the quality of food we're eating? Is it high quality? Is it junk food? And we can think about that with our own thoughts and beliefs and images. Are we feeding ourselves a regular diet of toxic thoughts, self-criticism, self-blame, for example? Or are we learning to cultivate a higher quality of what will nourish and support us physically and in our well-being and in our emotional health? Absolutely. So tell me a little bit more about your philosophy of guided imagery. I mean, is this something that, you know, maybe you put on an audio program, you know, once a day or once a week and listen to? Or is this more of like a lifestyle choice where you actually start to consciously, you know, think about different things so that you create those healing effects in your body? Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, it's it's parallel to meditation in this way, meaning that it can be very helpful to sit down on in a regular way, whether it's once a day. Some people even do it at the beginning and end of their day and have a devoted 20-minute time to go through an imagery practice. But just like meditation, for people who are very involved in that, they say, you know, those are just ways to support what happens in all those moments in between those formal times. You know, ideally we do become more aware of, for example, the thoughts that are going through our mind or the images that we're uh, cultivating. Is our mind filled with images of worry and fear? And again, once you practice imagery, you learn how you can change that and what you can do about that. Because we tend to be creatures of habit, and so sometimes we've uh, unknowingly developed like a worry habit, but that can be changed. So it really is both. It's very helpful to uh, devote time to sitting down and doing it regularly, but, but that's sort of the first step to it becoming a way of looking at the world with fewer preconceived notions, being much more present and curious to what life is bringing us on a moment-to-moment basis, to not just being absorbed in our thoughts and images, but being able to recognize that there's choice there and the ways that those things impact us. So it it really is both. Mm, That's awesome. Well put. Well, why don't you share some stories of, you know, things that you've seen in your practice, um, you know, recovery stories of patients. What are some some things that you've seen, some amazing things in your patients' lives after applying guided imagery? Okay. Um, Let me tell the story of someone I worked with named Daniel. And uh, I worked with him through the hospital. He was only in his early 50s when he had a heart attack, and it came you know, totally out of the blue, very unexpected. And in the hospital, guided imagery is part of a cardiac rehabilitation approach. There's nutrition and exercise, and this is part of the stress management arm of uh, support for healing and recovery. So he, um, this is a guy whose work uh, was in finance, kind of high pressure, get things done, and he was good at it. Um, And initially, our work was around, well, how can you just relax more? You know, how can you go about your work with a little more ease? How can you put it aside at the end of the day rather than carry it into your evening? How can you get a better night's sleep by learning progressive muscle relaxation, breathing? And so we started even a little bit preliminary to imagery because that's often a part of what we do before going into an imagery process is breath work and relaxation. And he was getting so happy with the results and a comfort with me that he became curious about guided imagery, what it is and what else we could do. So we did a session where uh, I invited him to bring his focus to his heart just sensing it from the inside out, and that he might sense it figuratively, symbolically, or literally, and just to ask it to show itself to him in some way. And he had an image arise, and he saw his heart as being a little bit bruised and battered from what it had been through. 
but healing. And I said, well, let your heart have a voice or a way of expressing itself to you. What does your heart want you to know? And he paused and he had sort of a welling up of emotion. And his, he said, my heart's saying, welcome back. You know, I, I'm, I've been waiting for you. And he wasn't even quite sure what that meant in the moment, but nevertheless it felt very moving. It got him very curious. So we we kept meeting and returning to this kind of message of his heart, and what he ended up sharing with me over time was that uh, his father had moved to his family to this country from Eastern Europe when Daniel was, I don't know, four or five. His father was uh, very hardworking, a shopkeeper by trade, and came here in the spirit of wanting his children to have a much better life and many more opportunities. Well, it turns out that as a young man in his 20s, Daniel was really drawn to landscape gardening and would have, you know, wanted to pursue that as a profession. But because of the kind of the pride and the family legacy of making a life for yourself in America, that profession didn't quite fit the family picture. And so he set it aside and went into this realm of business. Well, at this point in his life when he'd had this heart attack, he was looking at stress, he was looking at what his heart was saying, we went back and did more imagery around that, Daniel decided to make a very significant lifestyle shift and see if at this point in his life he could actually make a, a career change and, in his words, begin to respond to his own heart's desire. And he really recognized a resonance in being much more true to himself, who he is, in pursuing that career. So it turns out that his father had passed away about a few years prior, and at one point in our work, Daniel went to one of his favorite uh, public gardens and had picked up a small stone and carried it around in his pocket and very intentionally felt like he was offering gratitude to his father for what he'd offered him and sending that gratitude into the stone. He'd hold it in the palm of his hand. And after about a week, he went to his father's graveside and placed the stone on his father's grave in the spirit of kind of giving his father's dream back to him uh, with gratitude, but also making more room now for his own life and his own dream and kind of symbolically keeping his his ear to the pulse and the rhythm of his own life rather than responding to his father's. And I love this story because it happens so often in imagery, as you've said, where all the different parts of us are connected. So in this case, Daniel was really working on his physical health and getting his heart back in shape, but he was also working on his emotional heart and all the parallels and symbols between living his heart's desire uh, psychologically and lifestyle and really in just every level. So I, I love, I just again, I love to share that because it, it's such a good example of the ways that we can't in so many ways separate one thing from another. They're very connected. Mm, absolutely. You know, it's such a beautiful story. And, uh, you know, so many people that I know who are very, very successful in life, whether they're Olympic athletes or just very successful business people or, you know, whatever their field is, you know, almost all of them that I know do some kind of guided imagery process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like we have such a strong intuition within us and almost everyone, I mean, everyone out there, they know already inside themselves what they should be doing, what they should yeah. be doing differently. They know, you know, if they should be in a different career. They know if they should be eating healthier, exercising more. And sometimes they just don't do it because they get so busy and so distracted with daily life that they just forget about it. And I feel like this is such a powerful way to get back connected with yourself to create the life that you really want to have. That is exactly right. And, you know, I, I 
I like to sort of add the, the lighthearted joke that it makes it very easy for me as the practitioner or the therapist is I don't have to figure it out. All I need to do is sort of guide people to that place within themselves. And you're right, that's what they discover is like, oh, yeah, this feels right. I know this is true. I know this is right for me. You know, that that's what ends up happening. So Absolutely. Well, that's beautiful. And I know you've got a special gift uh, for all of our listeners. You're going to share an amazing guided imagery process with us, and that will be on the next podcast show. Uh, but are there any last words that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, just that I hope that this has sparked curiosity and can be looked at as an invitation, simply to try it, see what it's like, and and to let everyone's own experience, um, you know, be the guide of whether it makes sense to incorporate something like this in daily life. Um, I, I will mention that on my website I have lots of free resources because I am so eager to give people the chance to just try it out. There's free articles, there's free recordings, there's a lot of things that that people can just read a little more about it. So if, the, if people are interested, they simply go to lesliedavenport.com and there's a, a lot more information there. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Leslie. You're just uh, an incredible person. I know you're helping so many people, so thank you again for being with us. Thank you so much. Hey there, it's Tom Corson Knowles again. Hope you enjoyed the show today with Leslie Davenport. If you haven't already, please check us out at AuthenticHealthCoach.com. Come and join the community of like-minded people like you who want to live at their highest potential and a happy, healthy life. And also, please subscribe to us on iTunes, The Authentic Health Coaching Show, and make it an amazing day.